really authentically showing our own creations, like you and this radio show or you and that TV show, then, then there's, there's great meaning for you and there's meaning for those uh, who see that and respond. Wow. Oh, that, that is just amazing how you can pinpoint that. And I'll tell you why, because at this stage in my life, Michael, and, you know, I'm 65 years old now and uh, re- not, not retired, but, you know, slowing down in my practice, but have been able to do the things that I've really wanted to do for a long period of time. My kids are grown, you know, I'm uh, single now again after 30 years of marriage. And the idea being that, you know, I've started, uh, for instance, the UFO I team, which is an investigative team that goes out and re- researches UFO hotspots and paranormal activity. And I think one of my uh, life goals that you're mentioning here is not just to grab the spotlight, but to be out there in front and tell people that, you know what, it's okay there are some strange and wonderful things happening out there that we all need to kind of take a better look at and maybe, you know, help the uh, ascension process help it uh, happen more with the red pilling of the public, you know, on the things that uh, are going to be happening with disclosure down the road. I I really feel that that's uh, something that I've been able to pull together in my latter years here to help people kind of, become more aware of what reality really is. And that's why this moniker, the paranormal lawyer has really kind of <laughs> hit me <laughs> and, and taken off because people realize, Oh, you can combine the interesting uh, subjects of the law with paranormal. Yes, you can folks. And, uh, gosh, <laughs> I, I, I have kind of flabbergasted that you've, you've caught me in my act right there. <laughs> Well, like I said, I don't know how this stuff works. I just know that it works. Uh, I will caution you, though, that yes. there is a uh, a student path with this with this life purpose. That as there's a student path with every marker in the hand, and when we're not on the master path where things feel good, and as my mentor Pamela Lander says, on the master path things feel good and they're easy. On the student path, things don't feel so good, and they're hard. <laughs> so thank you, Pamela, for that language. The student path of this life purpose is what we call tomato fears. Ooh. So you know in the old days, uh, you know, when actors were on stage, and if, if they weren't doing a good job, the, the audience down in the pit would throw rotten vegetables at them? Oh, you're right. Yes. Yes. So that's the, the secret fear, or maybe not so secret, but that's, that's the fear of anyone who has this life purpose that you have of visibility. It's, I really yeah. want to be out there. I want to be showing myself on stage. I have an audience. I want the, the interaction and the appreciation and the approval, even the applause mm-hmm. of the audience. That means so much to me that I'm sharing my gifts and they're appreciating them. Mm-hmm. But what if they don't like me? Exactly. Oh my goodness! What if they goodness. don't like what I have to offer? What if they just can't stand me and they boo me off the stage or they throw rotten tomatoes at me? So we call that tomato fears. Oh my goodness! Yes, it's you, like the. Yeah, you've probably heard. Sorry, I'll, I'll just I'll just continue this thought of uh, Barbara Streisand. You know, one of our most beloved, famous performers ever of all time, who sometimes threw up, you know, before performances. She had such extreme, and maybe still has, extreme stage fright. Yeah. Yeah, It wasn't about her getting over that. It was just about her uh, coming to terms with her fear. What if they don't like me? What if they don't approve? What if they don't appreciate what I'm going to bring to them today? Oh, Michael, and I have got to relate this story that it directly... Uh, speaks to what you're just saying here is that, as you know, uh, one of my other lifetimes, <laughs> I was the <laughs> backstage host at the Universal Studios Amphitheater, and I was the the guy who was the gopher guy and took care of all the the 
big artists that came through the Universal Studios Amphitheater and hosted the parties after the show. I was the bartender. I was the gopher. I get everything that they needed to make them feel comfortable when they were performing their uh, their shows at the Universal Studios Amphitheater. And I'm talking Sinatra. I'm talking, you know, Barbara Streisand. I'm talking, you know, Willie Nelson. All the major uh, acts, including the rock acts, came through the uh, amphitheater. And the idea that you would think after years and years of um, performing that these artists would be would think of not you know just make it a breeze to go on and do a show but i saw routines and suspicious uh, suspicious uh, uh, you know things that they needed to do before a show just to make sure that they were prepared to go on and do their 3 hours on stage in front of thousands of people you know, at a very big venue in, in Los Angeles. I, I was amazed. You're right. Some people that have that marker that you're talking about still have that tomato fear when they go on stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do. And that doesn't mean that everybody that has a public life, uh, you know, has that degree of fear. But if your life purpose is your right ring finger... <laughs> which is where your life purpose is located in your fingerprints, uh-huh. then you know, that, that fear is definitely um, present and accounted for, and it, it's, it's part of the equation and, and part of the journey of becoming a performer or a, a teacher or you know, a radio host or a coach is learning you know, how to deal with that, how to, how to go on stage anyway and how to take care of yourself um, so that you can, you can do that safely and comfortably. I find it really interesting that you said, and I wrote this quote down, my job was to make them feel comfortable when performing. <laughs> right? That's what you said? Yeah. If you combine your gifted healer marking, which is all about helping people feel comfortable with their secrets, and, you know, helping them uh, break intimacy barriers and really get to know themselves, right? You're helping them feel comfortable in a public performing way. You're combining two markings in your hands. Oh, my so you're goodness. You're combining your, your gift marking of the healer and your life purpose of visibility. Such a well, great job for you. That was a perfect place for you to be, like a training ground evening. You're helping other performers get comfortable on stage and now you get to be the one on stage trying to make yourself feel comfortable uh, in the face of those fears. Oh, my goodness. That's, that is a great analogy there. Matter of fact, I've got to tell you a couple stories that are kind of polar opposites. But uh, for, <laughs> okay. for, for instance, uh, Frank Sinatra, when he performed, uh, this man was at the top of his game, still singing in full voice in his 80s. And uh, in 1974, 75, for about three years, I would uh, help, you know, the he would come through and do a whole week of shows. So I would actually get to know him and his crew pretty well, including Jilly Rizzo, his, his first mate, mate bodyguard guy that was very in, uh, interesting character. But uh, Frank Sinatra would literally, he was the only performer that I saw do this. He would literally do 45 minutes of vocal scales every night before the show with his musical director, Vinnie Falcone is his name. (laughs) Sit down at the piano and literally do the basic scales that everyone does in music class. I thought that was fascinating because he wanted to prepare for the show and and make his voice do what needs to be done, even in uh, his advanced years. He was a pretty amazing fella. Now, take wow. that uh, the other extreme. Uh, 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 Bob Bob Hope. Let's talk about Bob Hope. He uh, was in his seventies, probably when I got to work with him and be his uh, backstage host in the green room, uh, and. Sometimes uh, artists will have a lot of parties. They will invite uh, their friends, their music label 
uh, you know, their, uh, you know, the, the local LA, you know, brass would be invited for the show, uh, just to kind of like make their, uh, their connections, you know, for that uh, time during the year. Um, and we would literally for a Sinatra concert have a hundred people backstage. And of course the, uh, the uh, green room is just beautiful and lush, and we had a beautiful patio that went out and looked over the San Fernando Valley where you'd have another, you know, 25, 50 people out there. And I'm talking, I'm talking Burt Reynolds and Lonnie Anderson, and I'm talking Michael Jackson over in the corner here, you know, at my bar, you know, just kind of hanging out. <laughs> and Bob Hope would have no one in his green room. Not before or after the show, he would actually live. He lived down in the T- uh, T- T- not uh, Toluca Lake, which is just across or at the very opposite side of the back lot at Universal. That's that was his whole property around there in the old days when he owned mm-hmm. many of that uh, area in the San Fernando Valley, and he would just uh, jump in his own car. Of course, it had to be a Chrysler because that was he was you know famous for for uh, being on their commercials back in the old days. And he would drive up the back lot, come in the back door. Just before the show started, I'd say, uh, <laughs> hello, Mr. Hope. Uh, everyone's waiting for you. And there he goes. He'd do his, you know, two, three-hour show. And he'd get back off the stage. I'd give him a cold drink, and he'd be heading out to his own car and driving home. And he'd be home in about 20 minutes after he left the stage. <laughs> so there you go. You got people that wow. are wow, yeah, that's amazing. What a difference! Yeah, what a contrast. <clears throat> and of course, they were they were both about as big as you possibly could get in their careers uh, in show business, and both had different uh, approaches to uh, their their preparation and how they dealt with things. I wonder what kind of heart lines they each had. Now that's what that I wonder. Mm-hmm. That would be fascinating. And by the way, that kind of segues right into some of the things that we I wanted to ask you about historical handprints. Are there some available, and are you able to find the markers in uh, maybe famous famous folks that that are not around? Well, there are some. Yeah, there there are some. And uh, you know, Richard Unger has a lot more. Pamela Landers has a whole notebook of celebrity handprints. And I've been able to find a few online, and, and Pamela even sent me some. Thank you, Pamela. Um, and she emailed some to me. So I don't know. Yeah, I have a couple dead people in here. I sure do. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I have, yep, I have a couple dead people in this file. So yeah, we could talk about them. I've got Thomas Edison, or Albert Einstein. Sorry, not Thomas Edison. Albert Einstein. Oh, my goodness. Now, that would be fascinating. Yeah. And Nelson Mandela. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, I know what... there are lots of others, and sometimes, you know, we, we've looked at them in class, and uh, they've always been fascinating. Uh, yeah, Richard Oppenheimer, I don't have his prints with me, but I know something about his hands. Um, mm-hmm. That uh, is fascinating. So... Yeah, we can talk about them. Well, why don't you just uh, go ahead and pick one, and we'll start in. All right. Well, let's look at at Einstein. Such a fascinating guy with that kooky hair and that little bicycle that he rode around. And um, he has a, a very fiery shaped hand, and um, but he which which points to sort of a spontaneity and. Uh, you know, fun and uh, from here to there and jumping around and not really sticking with one thing. Uh, mm. Fiery shape, right? That's what fire does. It kind of jumps around and it goes wherever the fuel is. But his heart line and his headline are both relatively straight and they're long. So those point to a more logical, uh, logical approach to things. So... I'm supposing that, you know, Einstein had access to both ways of being, you know, this this very logical, uh, planned A to B to C, but then he could make these intuitive leaps 
Right? Mm-hmm. He would have to have been very creative and spontaneous to to make connections in ways that no one 